Hello, I'm Larry Greenwood, Chair of the Board of the Japan Society of Northern California. On January 24th this year, the Japan Society hosted the 2022 edition of our annual Japan Outlook Program, in which we have experts talk about prospects for the year in Japan and, and the U.S.-Japan relationship. This year, we had the privilege of welcoming two long-term observers of Japan's economy, politics, and foreign policy. Robbie Feldman is Senior Advisor at Morgan Stanley MUFG Securities and is well known in Japan as a frequent commentator on Japanese television. TJ Pempel is Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley, and he's inspired students of Japan for more than four decades through his teaching and many books and articles. I want to give special thanks to Asia Society Japan for its help in promoting the program. So let us join the program, which is underway with Robbie talking about what to expect in 2022 in Japan's economy. Enjoy. Uh, in terms of the longer term outlook for Japan, this is really about growth strategy. And I'm a bit of an outlier in giving Kishida pretty high marks uh, for what he said about uh, growth strategy. Uh, in his October 8th uh, policy speech at the Diet, um, he said uh, that the first pillar of growth strategy would be to make Japan a nation of science and technology. Kagak uh, gijiz rikkoku was the uh, phrase that, that he used. That's a beautiful phrase and it's exactly right because the agenda of raising productivity growth quite substantially in the face of aging is absolutely crucial to maintaining living standards and you can't accelerate uh, productivity growth and wages unless you get technology to diffuse faster. So he's absolutely right about that. The other part of his uh, agenda is this new capitalism. We don't really have a very good definition of it quite yet. We'll maybe discuss that a little bit later, as, as Larry mentioned. But what I'd like to point out uh, here uh, is that achieving this uh, uh, diffusion, faster diffusion of technology, requires that a lot of people change jobs. For example, there was a McKinsey study recently that said that over the next decade or so, uh, Japan would lose about 16 million jobs to new technologies and create about 11 million. The net decline of five is about the same as the decline of the labor force. So in aggregate numbers, it doesn't look so serious. It's serious because we have to find new jobs for 11 million people. That requires a great deal of churn in the labor market. So from my point of view, what the new capitalism should be about, and there are some signs of this, is educating people up to use the tech, new technology uh, to spread it faster. Um, so that's sort of where I think the, uh, the technology agenda and the new capitalism agenda are very, very much uh, in, uh, uh, in sync. Uh, that's not a common view, uh, but I think the, uh, the academic work on how technology spreads, the, the politics of innovation, so to speak, a wonderful book uh, by um, uh, Mark Zachary Taylor, uh, who's a, a political scientist in, in Georgia at uh, Georgia Tech, wonderful book there. And basically what you have to do is overcome the resistance of those who are invested in the old technology before you can get the new technology to spread. That's what he faces. Okay? Um, so I like what he's saying, but we're not sure whether it's really gonna happen. There are some positive signs. The um, uh, uh, new digital agency uh, that uh, he's put together, this is essentially a center of excellence. And it's taken about uh, 400 people from the different bureaucracies who will have to implement the new uh, digitalization and about 200 people from the private sectors, put them in a pot, mixed them up. Uh, we don't really have a lot of information on quite exactly what they're gonna do yet, but the fact that we're mixing private and public sector people, I think is a very good sign. In addition, uh, the com little committee uh, that uh, Kishida put together to advise him on new capitalism uh, is very heavy uh, with entrepreneurs. Okay. There are, I think, 15 external members, a couple are academics, very solid people, uh, but uh, I think eight or nine of them are actually people who've started new businesses, use technologies. And this suggests to me uh, that uh, that uh, approach uh, to growth is going to be very central uh, to what goes on. So I think the early signs are, are positive. Um, on uh, uh, other technologies that have to spread quickly. Um, here, I think uh, one of the most um, uh, encouraging things uh, is what's happening in the energy sphere. Uh, quite often, uh, people in markets, uh, people in the general debate look to the government to see what is the government doing about energy. 
Okay. Uh, I published a, a report uh, last August uh, about METI's new uh, energy uh, strategy. They, every three years, they put out a new plan. And on the cover of a report, uh, of the report, I put a picture of a very determined turtle. And the idea here is they want to get this done, but they're not moving as fast as they should. Um, in contrast, the private sector seems to be moving much faster. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is that they can see foreign countries moving faster, lowering their energy costs because the new technologies are now cheaper than the old technologies. And Japan will lose more and more and more competitiveness if it gets behind in energy. In addition, uh, there are, uh, shall we say, some new uh, interests involved. Uh, so for example, um, offshore wind. Japan can't do a lot on uh, fixed uh, turbine offshore wind because the sea gets too deep. However, uh, there's new technology in floating offshore wind. And this is something uh, that the authorities have embraced quite uh, aggressively. And there was a tender uh, a couple of days ago uh, where uh, the uh, winner came in uh, at a price that just stunned everybody else in the business. Uh, one of my students at uh, Tokyo University of Science, one of my uh, Zemi uh, students, these are uh, uh, people who, <clears throat> it's a mid-career program, average age is 43, okay? So this guy's a, a mid-career guy. And works for a wind power company. He quit a, 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 a nuclear power a concern and joined a wind power company. Um, and uh, he sent me an email saying, my gosh, these guys have come in through with this bid that's just insanely low. And this company happens to be one that has several foreign subsidiaries. So the, the, the notion of absorbing technology from the world and using it commercially in Japan is still very much alive. Doesn't mean we're gonna get there fast enough, but at least there's a lot of activity going on in the energy sector. And I have port to, uh, point to wind, uh, to um, hydrogen, to a number of technologies. Um, in general, uh, let me go back to how technology spreads and why this is, is so important, uh, which is you need a Godzilla. The first thing you need is some kind of huge, horrible thing attacking you to get everybody to think straight. And that's what climate change is. Uh, that's what aging is. There are a number of Godzillas out there. The second thing you need uh, is a um, uh, Dr. Serizawa, the guy who invents the oxygen destroyer, uh, the great new technology uh, that will solve the problem. But that's not enough. You have to have a national consensus to say, yes, we're going to do this. And in uh, some of my lecture materials, I use a picture uh, of the Meiji Emperor and uh, the Empress Shoken. Uh, because they were the ones, in a certain sense, who drove a national consensus uh, that, yes, we have to uh, globalize, we have to bring in two technologies, mix them together. So that national consensus is very important. And then finally, you need somebody uh, to uh, beat people over the head to get things done. Uh, and for that one, I use Churchill uh, as a crisis manager. Okay? Historically, Japan has been very good at recognizing uh, the Godzillas, it's been very good with technology and there's some stunning Japanese technologies in energy in DX everywhere else, uh, but it hasn't been particularly effective in consensus creation, at least not in the last 30 years. And it hasn't been particularly effective in having uh, uh, sort of aggressive guys to just get things done. Um, so those are the challenges that I think we face. So if I have to answer uh, the, uh, the question that uh, Hugh Patrick, my old professor uh, always asks, he's with us today. Um, on the, on the call, um, uh, his question is, what keeps you up at night? And what keeps me up at night about the economic outlook and the policy outlook in Japan uh, is the idea of complacency. Well, are people still just a little too comfortable uh, to make sure that things get done? Uh, so overall, I think the economy is in reasonably good shape. Uh, I think there are a number of fascinating new things uh, that Kishida is trying to do, um, but uh, the jury is still out. Uh, and it's uh, in the end, uh, a question of trust but verify. So let me stop there. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Ravi. A lot uh, for us to discuss later. Um, so let's turn to uh, TJ I, uh, and, and welcome uh, Professor Patrick. I'm glad you could join us. So we have I think maybe two actually graduates of Columbia here today in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, speaker. So uh, TJ, please. Thanks very much, Larry. And let me thank uh, the Japan Society of Northern California for inviting me back for this briefing. It's always a tough assignment, but uh, in the time that I've got with me, I want to address basically three substantial things. Uh, ultimately, I want to deal with what I see as the problems or issues facing Japan. But as a prelude to that, I want to start by saying a few things about the uh, political and economic 
resources that Japan will be able to bring to bear in the problems it face. And I think all too often we focus on the problems without looking at Japan's resources. And I just want to underscore a few of those as we go forward. Uh, I want to turn then to Japan's problems or issues uh, and look at both the domestic and the foreign policy concerns that will confront Japanese political leadership. And then finally, uh, to focus on how Japan has been dealing with them and what the prospects are going forward. Let me just underscore a couple of things about those resources that I think it's easy to forget. First of all, I tend to look at Japan in a comparative perspective. When I look at Western Europe and the United States, and I look at Japan, what I see is no major immigration battles, no burst of right-wing populism, no rollback in democratization. Basically, Japan scores exceptionally well on Freedom House's democratic score, uh, well above many Western European countries, certainly above the United States, which has been seeing a radical decline in its actual uh, democratic resources. Uh, Japan has also avoided the identity crises that have divided many other countries as a consequence of these issues. A second big thing, and I, Robbie mentioned this, Japan has dealt well with COVID basically, despite the slow start, uh, it's got a high vaccination rate, uh, the statistics on this are absolutely stunning when you look at deaths per capita uh, per 100,000, for example. Uh, Japan's death rate per 100,000 is something like 14, uh, well below the 264 in the United States, 180 to 220 uh, per 100,000 in most of Western Europe. So Japan is, Japanese are dying as a result of COVID at the 5 to 10% rate, which I think is stunning. Uh, it's also important, I think, despite two decades uh, that were so-called lost economic decades to recognize that Japan is still the number three economy in the world with a number of assets that it can bring to bear on its political problems, both domestic and foreign. As well, I think it's important to stress the fact that Japan has a very positive image in most of Asia and certainly across most of the world with the conspicuous exceptions of China, North Korea, and South Korea. And I think importantly, from a political standpoint is the current dominance of the LDP. Even though they lost about 25 seats in the last election in conjunction with their partner, the Clean Government Party, they still retain a clear parliamentary majority. And uh, as a consequence of this, uh, and a consequence of the fragmentation of the opposition, which has been fragmented since the demise of the DPJ after its 2009-2012 governance, basically, uh, the LDP is in a terrific position theoretically to put forward a cohesive and consistent approach to the problems that Japan faces. That said though, the LDP dominance, the LDP cohesion is somewhat artificial. We have to remember this is a party of, uh, that's unified basically by power, by patronage, rather than by policy. There's no cohesive socioeconomic coalition under it no agreed upon policy agenda. So the LDP runs the risk constantly of zigging and zagging between policy choices. And its policy is a it's, it's a party as a consequence that also suffers from a great deal of unpopularity. Roughly 40% of the population, as we know, are so-called floating voters whose allegiance can shift from one election to the next. Theoretically, they like strong and change-oriented leaders but those have not been in large number in Japan over the last several decades. Uh, I just went back and did the math on this. Over the last 40 years since Prime Minister Nakasone, Japan has had 20 prime ministers uh, and the only two conspicuous exceptions of sustained leadership were Koizumi and Abe, uh, Abe too. So Japan has this rotating revolving door of prime ministers, which makes it very difficult to come up with a cohesive set of policies and the LDP just contains what political scientists tend to think of as multiple veto players who can stop things from going forward, which is congruent with what I think Robbie was saying about uh, the difficulties of getting cohesive, head-breaking leadership that moves policy forward. What are the problems that Japan faces? Uh, if I think about domestically, there are gonna be a lot of political headlines and so forth that will capture the newspapers, but I think two of the problems that are most likely to be sustained and likely to play out 
over the course of the next year are twofold. One is the energy problem. And again, this is something that Robbie dealt with, but uh, I think Japan has made tremendous progress on clean energy with renewables, hydrogen, hydropower, et cetera. What I think the challenge will be is the effort by the government to move to the next generation nuclear technology and power, particularly given the nuclear allergy that Japan has faced for a long period of time, but particularly exacerbated since the Fukushima disaster. So energy and the introduction of nuclear power will I think be a very troublesome issue for Japan to face. Secondly, I think the economic issue is a deep one uh, we heard already about the demographic problems, uh, the aging process, and the low productivity in Japan. Japan, in many ways, is still stuck in what I see as a, as a fax mentality, still stuck with Hanko as the uh, equivalent of the DocuSign that many of us have gotten familiar with. And both will require both of these issues, the energy and the economics, will require really a complicated long-term focus and politically painful trade-offs. And it's not clear to me that the political structures, the LDP, will be in a position to do this. I think in many ways, this is the challenge for uh, Kishida going forward. Shifting to foreign policy, I think I would define Japan's issue or problem as how to balance off its economic and security interests as they deal with the changing regional order in East Asia. This is a problem of trade-offs. Uh, Japan's national interests really pull often in two competing directions security pulling it one way, economics pulling it in a competing direction. When I look at the regional order, China is clearly the biggest challenge to regional order, both militarily and in terms of its economic weaponization, weaponization of its economic strength. But also worrisome, of course, is the DPRK with its missile program, its nuclear program that provides an ongoing challenge to Japan. And equally problematic, at least in terms of building political bridges, is the deteriorating relationship with the ROK with South Korea. Uh, all of this represents, all of this dynamic represents a big change from an era of maybe 25 to 30 years between let's say 1980 and 2008 with the global financial crisis when most of the Asia Pacific was enjoying a period of increasing peace, better bilateral relationships and economic prosperity. And I think the role for Japan now is how to play a positive role in checking Chinese military assertiveness and its economic weaponization in ways that preserve the peaceful relationship in the region and the global liberal order from which Japan has benefited so greatly. So Japan's efforts in this regard have started with and, and been built heavily around strengthening its military and economic ties with the United States. Japan was hopeful that TPP would provide a nice bridge between economics and security we know, of course, that the Trump administration shredded TPP and all chances for the United States to build that economic and security bridge with Japan and with the region. But Japan has also uh, done its best to encourage the United States to sign on to the original Abe doctrine of a free and open Indo-Pacific, which the United States has done. Japan has embraced it fulsomely. And as well, Japan has embraced the Quad the relationship among India, Australia, Japan, and the United States, which has a very strong security component to it, but and seeks to look at multiple other issues as well. The budget for the self-defense force is now promising to be doubled to 2% of GDP. United, Japan has resolved its host nation support uh, funding for US troops. Japan and the United States have entered into a technical alliance, the Comprehensiveness and Resilience Partnership that seeks to fuse the technologies of the two countries in a way that will allow it to provide a check on China's efforts to dominate 10 or 15 high-tech high -tech, uh, technologies going forward into the future. Uh, Japan is also something going on. I'm getting some feedback. Yeah, no, we have, we're good. We put them on mute. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, Japan has also made a lot of efforts to bolster its relationship with Taiwan, both diplomatically and economically, and to raise the profile of Taiwan as another actor across the region. So, and it's also made substantial economic moves in the region to bolster free trade and investment, uh, all as ways to counter China. So for example, Japan has a major infrastructure program going on in Southeast Asia, 
that focuses on high quality infrastructure investment as a check on BRI or an alternative to BRI. Uh, Europe has signed onto that for its investment programs in Southeast Asia. Japan is boosting its ties with Australia. It signed a free trade agreement between Japan and the EU. Japan went forward with the heir or the successor to the TPP, which is CPTPP, and to continue the alphabet soup. Japan has also signed on to RCEP, the Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, that basically covers 40% of the trade of the world, all of which focuses on East Asia. So all of this has seen Japan moving forward in many ways, but at the same time, Japan cannot shake the economic interdependence with China and with regional supply chains. Japan is economically interdependent with China. China is Japan's largest export market, $141 billion versus $118 for the United States. And in an ironic way, in September of this year, Japan and China will mark 50 years of the normalization of their bilateral relationships. It will be interesting to see what, if any, ceremonies come out of that. So Japan, like most Asian countries, is seeking to check China's assertiveness and aggressiveness, but is not in any way interested in trying to decouple economically from China. The end result of which is that uh, it is pulled and buffeted in these security versus economic directions. I think one of the biggest problems Japan faces within the region now is the relative absence of the United States. The United States is becoming something of a one-trick pony in Asia. It has large numbers of destroyers, submarines, aircraft carriers, et cetera, in the region, a big naval presence, but it's virtually absent from Asia in terms of economic engagement, multilateral engagement in trade packs, FTAs, and the like. We saw this start with the Trump administration and the Trump tariffs, but that has continued, and the mood in Washington now is very much that of economic nationalism uh, and a, an effort to challenge China on all fronts, which runs counter to what Japan is trying to do in the region. Uh, so all of this will come to the fore in the next political test, which is the upper house elections in uh, July of this year. The opposition parties have sought to become a party of younger voters uh, with Izumi uh, Kenta as their leader. They focus on a lot of issues that young people are attracted to, green growth, anti-nuclear stance, gender equality, uh, more online government, et cetera. But for the most part, these are very underdeveloped talking points without policies behind them. And the opposition still lacks a serious electoral organization capable of mobilizing voters nationwide. For Kishida, I think the challenge is whether he can present a positive an attractive image for the LDP that will attract a number of those floating voters. And basically the question now is which party leader, which party can deliver some kind of appealing and easy to understand alternative to the general public. My guess of course is that Kishida is making substantial moves in that direction and going about it rather well. But of course the number of stumbling, stumbling blocks between now and July could be extremely high. Basically then, for me, the, the broad question that links what I have to say with what Robbie was having to say is whether Japan can really manage the kinds of structural change that will return Japan to the more economic, or greater economic dynamism uh, and demonstrate the kind of regional and global leadership and salience that it has the potential to provide, or whether the numerous veto players within the LDP and within the government will slow that down, whether we will have that ongoing smiling turtle that moves forward at a very lethargic pace, or whether we can see a Japan that is going to take a much more fundamental position across the Asian region uh, as a result of a greater economic dynamism. So let me stop on that note uh, as well, and then we'll be able to field questions like it. Great. Thanks very much, TJ. It's fantastic. And uh, fit very nicely with uh, what Bobby had just mentioned as well. Let me, um, let me start off with a question for Ravi. Um, and it, it actually, but it has a political impact as well. So, so PJ would be interested in your views on this. And that, that, that is the income inequality issue. Uh, Ravi, you had mentioned up front that, um, that because of global inflation and its impacts uh, on Japan, in particular because of the energy price increases, 
um, that you saw wages actually being kind of suppressed this year. It would be, be difficult to, to get wages up. That's going to be a disappointment and a headwind, I guess, for the government who is, I understand, trying to at least uh, strong arm uh, people and men into making a higher, uh, higher wages in this next um, people coming up in, in the spring. Um, is that is that going to be an issue? And, and what what uh, what are what does the new administration plan to do to to deal with um, this uh, the issue of income and wealth inequality, which is as I mentioned, both an economic as well as a very key political issue within within the economy. Uh, thanks very much. Um, the inequality issue is certainly not going away. If you look at OECD statistics, you find that the Gini coefficient, the measure of inequality uh, in Japan is a little bit above the OECD average. Uh, Japan has a somewhat higher uh, proportion uh, of people in poverty uh, relative to the OECD uh, average, higher percentage. Uh, and so that issue is not going away. Uh, the point I think that uh, uh, Kishida is trying to make is that you can't get higher wages without higher productivity, and that takes you back to re-education and, um, and uh, also social capital of that point. So it's going to take a much, much more focused approach uh, to uh, uh, create an ongoing education uh, system. Uh, to retrain people in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, we need uh, another uh, round of uh, uh, labor market reform. Um, the one done under Prime Minister Abe was, in my view, essentially a failure uh, because they uh, essentially uh, raised the price uh, of um, uh, full-time employment so you get less of it. More people get dumped into the unorganized market and the dual structure of the labor market only got worse. Um, so those issues are uh, out, still out there. They have to be addressed. But uh, from uh, this is really TJ's uh, area. But um, as I see it, the, if you look at the voting patterns of the young folks, particularly in the last election, they did not vote for the opposition parties. Uh, they voted much more uh, for the uh, Osaka Ishin party, uh, which did quite, quite well. Uh, most of the pickup, if I understand rightly, uh, in the seats uh, was uh, left the, the seats that left the LDP mostly went to the, uh, to the uh, right wing uh, or kind of right wing um, a party uh, from Osaka. If you look at their website, they have on their website a proposal for basic income, which is kind of an interesting thing for a center right party to be proposing. Um, so uh, here the issue is will, as TJ mentioned, uh, will the people with the, the veto actors uh, in the system prevent that kind of uh, expansion of uh, of, uh, of uh, called social benefits on a, a broader, uh, uh, broader basis. Um, here's where uh, some numbers actually come in uh, rather interesting and useful. Uh, one of the numbers is uh, the proposal from um, uh, Heizo Takenaka a couple, about a year and a half ago, where he said maybe Japan should have a universal basic income, uh, call it uh, 70,000 yen per person per month. Um, so he just sort of floated that idea. He hasn't pursued it much since then, but the idea is out there. If you take that number and calculate what percentage of GDP that would cost, it turns out uh, to be about uh, 18, 19% of GDP. So it's a large number. So you would have to cut that much of other benefits in order to make room for this. Turns out the total social spending in Japan is about 21% of GDP. So that would leave the country with about three percentage points of GDP uh, for folks who really, really need uh, social support and basic income just wouldn't work for them. So in a certain sense, uh, Japan could replace uh, some of the uh, national pension uh, uh, payments uh, with this uh, basic income. Now, of course, in Japan, as in many other countries, the idea of basic income is rejected by a lot of people because they think, oh, they'll just go play pachinko. They'll just go drink it away. Um, why should we give money to people who don't work? That sort of stuff. Um, which is, of course, here in the U.S. as well. Turns out that many of the experiments done around the world, and it's interesting, there's so many new ones happening now. What they discover is the only people who reduce working hours when they get basic income are single mothers uh, and students. And both of those groups probably should be reducing their working hours. Okay? Uh, so basically, this idea of basic income, I think, is going to have to come bubble up from the top. I do not expect it to be an issue before the upper house election. Uh, but it's something that is necessary, I think, 
to give people the incentives to acquire the new skills to get the technology to go. So what I'm focused on on this um, inequality issue is whether Japan can make any serious progress uh, using the uh, taxpayer idea, or now the my number system uh, as a way to uh, distribute benefits to the people who need them uh, and introduce what I would call really a negative income tax. Uh, it's quite interesting that that idea is really a basic income system, but it was proposed by uh, the uh, right-wing economist, Milton Friedman. Um, it might not be right to call him right-wing. He was a libertarian economist. But at any rate, uh, it's uh, uh, an idea that even President Nixon tried to introduce but couldn't get over hurdles. Anyway, the point here is that the basic income, I think, is going to be the focus of the debate, but I don't expect that to happen until after the upper house election. All right, if I could pick yeah, please, oh, sorry. No, just no, no, piggy, piggyback on what uh, what was just said, and that is to say, I think one finds the possibility of uh, technological or IT enhancement, as mm -hmm. well as productivity enhancement, if Japan were somehow or other to stop being a nation for old men or a country for old men. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, you know, I mean, they, they're, they're, it's so difficult for young people to leapfrog up and to be in a position where they can actually introduce, let us say, large scale technological improvements in a company uh, because the founder of the company is still coming in at the age of 90 to oversee the CEO of the company who's overseeing the executive branch of the company. Uh, and nobody's in a position to say, we shouldn't be doing this uh, the way we did it when the company was founded. And as a consequence of which, both young people and women who mm -hmm. can bring tremendous assets to this productivity question are in many ways left out. And I think that exacerbates some of the inequality that uh, mm -hmm. Robbie was just talking about. So just piggybacking on what he said to flesh it out a bit. Mm -hmm. This is really an issue of corporate governance uh, at the corporate level, but at the national level, as TJ uh, pointed out, the veto actors, and this is true in companies as well, have far too much power. So if I may ask a political science question, under what circumstances uh, do rule uh, making mechanisms, that is the rules about who makes the rules, under what circumstances do those uh, rule making mechanisms change? And can we expect anything from Japan on that? I'd be slow to say yes to that. <laughs> what I would say is that at least at the corporate level, and I think it could be done at the governmental level, uh, Jack Welch at GE did something very interesting when he found out that most of his mid-level and upper-level executives were still having their secretaries uh, read their email. They were typing out or punching out memos on a, on a piece of paper and handing them to uh, the secretary to send his email. Basically, Welch re required that every executive, every mid-level executive and up over 40, take on a reverse intern, a 23 or 24-year-old, to provide them with the technological skills by having to put in two or three hours a week showing these middle level managers uh, how to use their email, how to get around faxes, how to hold internet meetings, et cetera, et cetera. That could be done at a corporate level if corporations were willing to empower those young people. And all you're doing is basically calling them interns. They don't, they don't really have power, but they transfer some skills that come second nature to them uh, onto, uh, onto the senior leadership. And that, that could be done at the governmental level as well. But I think fact, changing, the rules is, changing the rules is always tough in Japan, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. Actually, Jack Welch did something else, uh, now that you've mentioned him, which is introduce the idea of a reverse mentor uh, as well, and not just for tech, but for everything else. Um, and uh, I asked uh, a, a senior, uh, well, a, a minister uh, last June in one of uh, the Morgan Stanley events, uh, have you heard of this you know, reverse mentor system? And what do you think? Should the government, could each cabinet minister have somebody max age 35 as a mentor to the ministers? And he said, yeah, we should do that. In fact, I've already got one. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, the most successful case of that is probably Audrey Tang. Uh, she was the reverse mentor uh, for her uh, predecessor as technology minister in Taiwan. Uh, so that's some uh, an idea that I think we need to, uh, to, to study and, and just get some new blood uh, inside the old blood, as you say. Um, I, I also wanted to follow up on the, uh, what um, Bobby said about uh, labor reform. Uh, this has obviously been an ongoing issue in Japan 
as Robbie mentioned, uh, the dual system of full-time and part-time has uh, exacerbated the, uh, the income inequality, certainly the, the perception of the income inequality. Uh, it's also um, exacerbated the gender inequality since most of the temporary workers are women. Um, and that seems to be growing mainly to protect the, um, the full-time jobs of the very the decreasing number of, of full-time employees uh, at the, um, in the large companies. Uh, that's a bit of a tough one for them to crack. Is there any prospect for labor, re uh, labor reform uh, legislation this year, TJ? Was that aimed at me, Larry? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was, uh, that was aimed at you, yes. Is there any prospect okay. for a labor reform uh, legislation? I don't see it as, as, a big, uh, as a big issue going forward. I, 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 uh, I would expect that, uh, that this is not going to be Top of top of mind uh, for Kishida and the then the government. Uh, of course, I always remain to be uh, proven wrong, but I I don't see it on the horizon, frankly. And you would would you agree with that, Robin? Uh, yes, I would. And my sense is that labor reforms happen in the market before they are uh, legalized by the Diet. That is the Diet. Uh, it's a very big, complex issue, and it's hard to figure out exactly what rule is going to make sense. Uh, their attempts to uh, change laws about part-time workers were really not particularly successful. Um, and so I think the, the point here is that we have to see what the markets cough up uh, in terms of what makes sense. And once that's done, then the legislators uh, will get around to encoding the best uh, part of that uh, in law. So I don't see it as a, a major uh, priority, but that doesn't mean nothing is happening. In fact, I, I expect uh, there to be a lot of exploration uh, at a called a, a, a grassroots level of what kind of uh, new uh, arrangements make sense. For example, now we have commuting alliance, uh, allowances for companies, but nobody's commuting. So why should the companies pay that? But we don't have allowances for the electricity uh, and lighting that you use at home when you're uh, remoting in. So don't we need to juggle something uh, on that uh, score uh, to make, uh, make the system a little more rational? But that'll happen at the, at the grassroots level, not at the legislation level. Let's uh, turn to energy. Uh, you both mentioned that as a, as a major issue for Japan um, and the nuclear issue. So um, let me just start with TJ. So you mentioned obviously the, 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 um, uh, the, the backlash to nuclear power after Fukushima. And um, uh, yet Japan is slowly, I guess, opening up new uh, plants. What, what's the prospect for uh, getting more plants open is, is nuclear is it still an option for japan or is it something that's on its way out i think it has to be an option for them uh, i mean as you know as we all learned uh from our econ 101 uh when we were working on japan uh you know japan is a poor island nation devoid of natural resources that must import all of its energy in order to survive yada 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 um, and uh, about a lot of trade negotiations as, as well. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's a it's a cliche we've all heard, uh, and it seems to me that uh, that the nuclear power, from everything I can read about it, is it's doable in a safe way, and it would certainly bolster wind power, geothermal, and all the other clean energies that are going forward. Obviously, it has to be a new form of nuclear power. Uh, the old reactors that were positioned all along the coast, too close to the uh, to the water, suffered from the kinds of things that we saw at Fukushima with uh, the possibility of tsunami. Uh, so they need to be moved up and and so forth. And uh, whether the whether the local areas can be encouraged to accept these or not, I think is always a problem. Uh, nobody seems to want to have a possible Chernobyl in their backyard. For obvious reasons, uh, but I do think that the government is in a position where it's going to be able to try to put the big sell on for this, whether it's going to happen in a serious way this year or whether it's going to take a little bit longer, I guess is a, a something of an open question, but I think Japan is clearly likely to be moving in that direction uh, with, with some degree of uh, consistency between both government and, and the business sector. If I may uh, pipe in a bit on that, um, uh, the, um, the question of using the current nuclear reactors, I think is kind of on the way to being settled pretty well. We're already, we've already restarted, I think either nine or 10 reactors. Uh, there are a total of 27 that probably can be used 
uh, a few of the ones that aren't decommissioned yet of the original 51, a few of the ones that aren't decommissioned have not even applied for restart, uh, which probably means that they're not likely to uh, be el eligible at any point. Um, so uh, if we get those 27 all back uh, online, use them, maybe increase the capacity utilization a little bit, um, that'll help us uh, get to 2030 uh, uh, climate uh, goals. The question in my mind uh, is, will the population accept more restarts? The answer is yes, because the nuclear um, uh, uh, oversight people are much, much, much better than they used to be. So there, I don't think there's a big issue. The question comes in uh, after 2030 or so, will Japan build new nukes? And if so, what kind? Are they going to be uh, some kind of new design of fission reactors? Or by that time, uh, will we have uh, fusion re uh, uh, facilities that are actually usable? And there's a lot of huge technological progress in fusion. I'm still a little bit skeptical, uh, but it's something that you know you, you have to push the research on. I would go for the fusion rather than fission uh, because it's a much more you know long-term uh, solution. Um, but in the meantime, we've got other technologies that are also moving very, very rapidly. Uh, the investment house Lazard uh, has does a, um, uh, a, a survey every year of the cost of different kinds of electricity generation. Uh, and it's not just the running cost, it's the capital cost. They put everything and get a uh, overall uh, unit cost per kilowatt hour. They've been doing this since 2009. Uh, nuclear has actually gone up since then. Coal is still flat at about 11 cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, PV solar has gone from 36 cents per kilowatt hour in 2009 down to 3.7. Okay, so it's down by 90%. Okay, it's cheaper than coal. Okay, uh, it's very much cheaper than nuclear. Okay, uh, and uh, then we have the hydrogen issue. Okay, uh, standard gray hydrogen now costs about two dollars per kilo per kilogram. Uh, the best green hydrogen is about three, but there are new uh, technologies in green hydrogen that are uh, advancing very very rapidly, and a number of firms are out there saying that they will have one dollar green hydrogen. Uh, by the end of the decade. The US uh, Department of Energy has announced a Manhattan Project type um, uh, initiative to bring that about. Uh, METI is on board with that and they're doing their own version of it, probably cooperating with the US. Uh, so the question is, is, is not so much nuclear versus non-nuclear, it's whether nuclear technology advances fast enough to be cheaper than other technologies. Uh, we haven't discussed the, uh, the waste problem yet, uh, but uh, to me, it, this is going to be a market-driven uh, point rather than a, um, uh, a um, sort of a nukes or not nukes uh, sort of question. Um, actually, this is uh, drawn from a question that we just got on the on chat from, from uh, I think, uh, uh, S. Anderson. But, uh, but it, since it's directly related to this, let me just ask it right now. And, and that is, so what are the prospects um, given that uh, change in cost structure for continued uh, exports of uh, fossil fuels, in particular LNG from the United States to Japan? It's a big part of our export growing. Uh, we've put a lot of investment in that uh, LNG uh, to, to export to Japan. Um, is, this, uh, is, this, is this gonna be um, a, a failed investment over time or is, it, uh, is there still gonna be um, uh, space for LNG well, if I may, um, LNG is certainly part of the solution uh, in a certain sense, uh, because the amount of CO2 it produces while being burned uh, is half of what coal is. Okay, Japan still has a lot of coal plants. A lot of them are new as well. But the, the issue there is really, can you mix something into the coal facility uh, fuel uh, which is, they use it uh, for gasification anyway. Can you mix something into the fuel that makes it cheaper? So if, I don't know the technology on this, but if LNG could be combined with that, that would be nice, but more, uh, that would be more ammonia uh, hydrogen. Um, that said, one of the problems with uh, LNG, uh, which is not usually uh, cited, is leaks. Uh, in Japan, uh, the amount of uh, 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 methane that's leaked into the atmosphere is very, very low from the pipes. I mean, Japan has really good pipe technology, but, uh, the producer countries don't necessarily have such good technology and leaked methane going into the atmosphere is far, far, far more uh, damaging uh, 
uh, uh, than uh, CO2 because it stays in the air longer uh, and uh, it has a, a, basically an enhanced effect. So uh, LNG is a great idea as a transition fuel, but we uh, do have to make sure uh, that the production process doesn't leak more uh, methane into the atmosphere and make it worse than the coal uh, or uh, petroleum that, it, that it's replacing. So my overall answer to the question is, it's a transition opportunity, but probably not more than that. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to have one, one question on international relations, and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. And uh, this is to TJ. Um, so TJ, you mentioned that Japan, uh, that, that the U.S. has left a vacuum in the economic area for, in terms of regional initiatives. Uh, and um, I guess my question has to do with uh, to what degree, or let me say another thing, it, it appeared that um, under Prime Minister Abe, but Japan actually stepped into that vacuum during the Trump administration and uh, you know, took a lot of initiatives in the region, including, of course, the CPTPP um, uh, on its own, and basically filled the vacuum left by the United States. Is that likely to continue in that area, given the fact that it doesn't look like there's much progress in Washington in this area? Um, and uh, how much of that was due to Prime Minister Abe's own kind of personality, his charisma, his desire to, for Japan to play a larger role in the world. Is that going to continue on the Prime Minister at the I think, I mean, I think that uh, Prime Minister Abe made a pretty courageous decision politically uh, in terms of trying to join TPP. I think it was going to require uh, a lot of rapid changes in the Japanese business structure and a lot of uh, sacred cows were going to be gored as a consequence of that. But of course, he was expecting that as a consequence of TPP, Japan would gain access to the US market. And that was part of the trade-off. But it was it was a way, I think, for Japan and Abe to see a fusion between economic and security interests in the region, to pull the United States in, not only as a security partner, but as an economic partner. So in an ideal world, and I'm sure this was in Abe's mind, and I think advocates of the uh, TPP felt the same way, that um, the idea would be that, as uh, President Obama put it, uh, TPP would be writing the rules for trade and global investment and uh, the like in a way that uh, China would not. And the goal, it seems to me, was either twofold, to either provide carrots or sticks to China. Uh, the carrots would be make the changes domestically in China that would allow China to qualify for, CP, uh, for TPP membership, uh, which would take it away from state-owned enterprises to some extent, would take it away from state direction, would introduce more market forces. Uh, but at the same time, if, if China were not prepared to do that, there would be a very powerful economic alliance, uh, trading alliance, investment alliance that would be driven by Japan and the United States with secondary partners like Australia or Canada, et cetera. Uh, when, the, when the Trump administration, when Donald Trump tore that up, I think, uh, you know, after his initial heart attack, uh, Abe pulled himself back together and pushed forward the CPTPP, which I think has always been predicated on the notion that maybe the United States will somehow rejoin this. But I can't imagine a, an America rejoining that given the domestic political climate in the United States. I mean, to put it in blunt terms, the Democratic Party has never been a free trade party in any unified way. There are certainly many in the Democratic Party who would prefer some version of free trade, freer trade, uh, particularly if it comes with economic uh, guarantees, environmental guarantees. Uh, TPP, I think, would have that. CPTPP would have that. But uh, clearly, the Republicans would be more likely to favor TPP in the abstract but I can't imagine a, a Republican party today that would be willing to grant Biden any win under any circumstances, uh, even, if, uh, even if Biden himself were convinced that TPP would be a good thing for the United States to rejoin. So I think the United States is going to continue to be on the outside looking in, trying to cut bilateral deals with uh, trade partners in ways that are gonna be advantageous to the US, but the US takes itself out of that bargaining process that's much more widespread across the region and into which so many Asian countries that are tied together by regional production networks, global production networks, 
are so intimately involved. And the United States, I think, runs the risk of becoming a, uh, a, a, a diplomatic presence with only a hammer in its toolbox. Um, you know, economic relations are not going to substitute for aircraft carriers in the event of a war. But on the other hand, uh, you know, how we're looking at Taiwan, not that we want to talk at length about Taiwan, I think the greater threat to Taiwan is not an invasion from China, but more likely economic strangling uh, by China of Taiwan through investments, et cetera, trade restrictions on tourism, et cetera. And the United States is not in a powerful position to change that uh, because of its, uh, its lack of a, a powerful economic presence in the region and the growing economic nationalism in the US. Those are discouraging words, but I'm, I'm afraid that you're probably right. Uh, Robbie, anything to add to that before we go to questions to the audience? Not specifically, but I have a question if I may raise one for the audience, because obviously China is a huge presence in the room uh, when we talk about Japan uh, or any other country. When we talk about China, there are two questions that I always have, which is, uh, first of all, who are we talking about? Uh, I think in the American debate, we've tended to uh, fuse uh, the concept of China uh, with the concept of Xi Jinping, and sometimes a little bit larger with the Communist Party. Uh, but when we talk about China, exactly who are we talking about? Um, isn't China a large, complex, difficult country to manage? Uh, and if so, could uh, you know uh, countries elsewhere take advantage of that of that fact and change somehow change the internal dynamics to make uh, to bring China back into a, a global community? So that's one question: Who is China? The second question is: Where do we get our information about it? Because something that really frustrates me is I have a really hard time figuring out what's going on inside China because the uh, quality inf of information is so poor. Nobody has any trouble figuring out what's going on in the US, not that it's pretty, but at least we've got a lot of information about it. So we kind of can or, uh, uh, analyze what's happening. How do we get a handle on what's actually going on inside China to inform our, uh, our uh, policy and, and uh, business decisions? So that I just wanna raise those two questions in case people have comments or, uh, or hints about what to do. Great, thanks. We'll, we'll see if we get a response from some of the other things. Um, obviously, on that second point, China has been, in some ways, its own worst enemy by essentially pushing out all the foreign journalists and many of the foreign journalists and, and making it almost impossible for those who remain to, to do any reporting. So. Um, uh, let's turn to, um, let's see, uh, Greg uh, Howell um, to ask the first question about immigration. Uh, Greg? Oh, yes. Yeah. Hello. Thanks for taking my question. So my question deals with uh, what I think, and I just want to ask the guests, do they agree that the biggest challenge to face in Japan is a falling birth rate? And I know a lot of Western countries and developed countries are facing that, but particularly Japan, uh, because Japan is not really allowing immigration. And I'm wondering, one, do they think do they agree that that's the biggest problem facing Japan in the future? And two, uh, do you think Japan will have to use immigration to, to solve it uh, if they're not going to you know, use economic incentives to raise the birth rate internally. You know, like like offering better, low cost, you know, child care and, and paying uh, families to have more kids. Okay, maybe I can start and uh, ask TJ to, to jump in on that. Um, uh, during the Suga administration that just ended, uh, they finally decided to allow um, uh, sort of uh, the medical uh, aspects of pregnancy to be covered by the national medical system. This has been debated for 40 years. They've been complaining about the birth, falling birth rate for 40 years. And then they finally, finally decided to allow uh, the national medical system to, to cover it. So here's a, a, an action that they took, but it's far, 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 far too late. I think it's too late to do anything about the, the falling birth rate. Uh, it would take massive, massive, massive subsidies uh, for child, uh, 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 for children, uh, for families with children. Um, it's a huge, huge problem. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can define a biggest problem. That's because there, there are so many big ones. But it's certainly something that I don't think they can do too much about at this point. China has the same problem, uh, probably uh, at least as large. Korea is a little bit larger, actually. Uh, but I'm not sure that there are any subsidies that we could have or 
um, uh, uh, extra social programs that would fundamentally change the long-term outlook. I think there are a lot of things that should be done, better daycare, uh, better support for families with, with children, uh, but I don't think they're going uh, to, uh, to raise the birth rate enough to really matter in a, a, a meaningful horizon. On immigration, um, uh, the, an the answer there is that they have a system that's actually pretty, uh, uh, on paper, very, very good because you can get permanent residents very, very easily. Uh, if you've been here uh, five years, you know, it's really, a, it could be done on a computer if they decided to do that. There's still a lot of red tape involved, but it, but it could be done. The question is, who do they let in and who do they want uh, to let in? Uh, because with uh, IT uh, replacing a lot of the low-end labor now, what Japan really needs uh, is the high-end labor. Uh, and there, uh, it's a matter, I think, of taxation systems um, and uh, ease of living in Japan. As I talk to folks in the, uh, the IT industries, Japan is a very, very popular place to live, but with the tax rates where they are, people don't want to come for very long. Um, so I think those, uh, the immigration issue really comes down to the economics of whether it makes sense to move from wherever you are into Japan. Uh, and I don't see uh, immigration as becoming a, uh, uh, call it a, a popular tool uh, to make that happen. One other piece of data that I got that was really uh, fascinating and amazing to me is if you look at attitudes toward uh, immigration, prefecture by prefecture, uh, what I uh, tried to do was look at those attitudes and relate them to the degree of aging uh, in the prefectures. And I had thought, uh, that attitudes toward immigration would be uh, more open in prefectures that had a very high share of elderly because those are the people who come and help you out. Turned out it was exactly the opposite. So it's the, the prefectures that have a high share of elderly who are a little more uh, closed-minded on, on that issue. I don't think there's too much that we can do about that. So my expectation is that we're not going to see any huge uh, increase of immigration, although we may see see some uh, improvements in, uh, call it the high-tech uh, immigration area, where I think Japan is a very attractive place uh, for, for people to live. Hope that just, makes some sense. Yeah. Just to piggyback on that, I mean, I think uh, two things that are worth keeping in mind. On the one hand, the government has this uh, essentially internship program or training program in which an awful lot of low-end, low-skill workers are brought in to do classic manufacturing, the dirty jobs, the cleanup jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And then after two, three, four years, they're expected to leave. And as Robbie was saying, that's not in many ways the area where immigration is most likely to be helpful to Japan. The immigration moves, my guess would be, are most likely to come not particularly from the United States, but more likely from uh, technologically sophisticated people in, say, Korea or even China, where for many of them, learning the Japanese language, uh, adjusting to Japanese uh, patterns of behavior, et cetera, are a lot easier or a lot less uh, conspicuous. And it's a little bit easier for a Chinese or a Korean living in Japan to blend in than it is for uh, many of us Caucasians to uh, simply walk down the streets without conspicuously setting off the gaijin red flags. Uh, so I, I, but I do think that um, it's in those high tech areas that, that we're likely to see the biggest changes, but whether this is permanent living in Japan or temporary residence in Japan is the more likely issue. I, I, I'm guessing it's gonna be a lot less permanent residence and a lot more uh, technical, uh, um, temporary residence. And lastly, I guess I would say that the little data I've seen on this at the prefectural level uh, suggests that an awful lot of the rural prefectures are actually, the governments in the rural areas are far more willing to accept foreigners coming in for nursing or uh, technical skills, assistance in elderly care, et cetera, et cetera. This doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna be popularly accepted, but the governments themselves are far more generous in, in their uh, willingness to accept people and local, local governments and local NGOs are far more anxious to provide language training assistance uh, to uh, new residents to provide them with information about which of the 17 different ways to sort your garbage is the right way to do it on a, on a Wednesday, uh, how to deal with government bureaucracies, et cetera. So there seems to be a, a, a much greater tolerance, at least 
between those NGOs and, and the uh, local governments. But I would not envision, you know, Japan having 5% foreign residents uh, 10 years from now or 15 years from now. I think that numbers are going to be still quite small. Great. Thanks for the question, Greg. Uh, we have a question from uh, from Paul uh, uh, Betty, or Be Bettel, sorry. Paul? Thank you, Paul, Paul Betty. My question was actually with relation to the energy sector. Um, you know, Japan has a tremendous asset in the country that they could develop domestically called geothermal. Yeah. Um, they have up to 23 gigawatts of potential output. Um, so far, they're using less than 2% of that. Is there ever a scenario when the Onsen Association might get out of the way and allow that asset to be developed? Thanks very much. Um, I think it's very interesting that you uh, pointed to the Onsen Association uh, <laughs> as the, uh, the veto uh, actor uh, that's uh, preventing this. That's one of them, of course. Uh, but of course, there's the location of those uh, geothermal resources is another one. I think it comes down to cost uh, in the end. Uh, that said, uh, if it's uh, 23 uh, gigawatts, uh, that's the equivalent of 23 nukes if you can actually use all of it. Um, but that's not an absolutely huge number. Um, because uh, the number of, or the amount of extra electricity Japan is going to need, say that we shift from gasoline cars to EVs, that would require about a 25% increase in electricity generation to generate the, the power needed to run those cars. Okay? Uh, so geothermal, I think, is important. Uh, it could be much, much better utilized. Uh, but as you say, there's a political economy problem that is so difficult to deal with that my guess is that other uh, technologies are probably going to take uh, take uh, uh, or put put geothermal, uh, keep it in the back seat for a while. That would be my my uh, my expectation on it. And uh, I'm sorry, but that's sort of the, the way I'm I'm seeing it right now. If you have uh, any more positive uh, uh, positive take on it, let me know. Are you involved in the geothermal industry? No, not directly. I'm I'm in the IT sector, but uh, mm -hmm. it's it's a fascinating conundrum in my opinion. There, there's a lot of things Japan could be mm -hmm. doing on renewable power side mm -hmm. that it's not. Um, mm -hmm. And, I, and yeah. I do, I disagree that, that they're going to be able to get back to 22, 23% capacity mm -hmm. on nukes by 2030. I don't, I can't imagine the public can do that. that. I don't think they will either. But if they want to get there, that's, that's what they have to do. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And it's, it's interesting also, because TJ mentioned the old sort of scratch on our mind, uh, to use Harold Isaacs's term, that Japan is a, a country without natural resources. Well, if they're sitting on 23 gigawatts of geothermal power, that's a resource. Okay. There's a lot of wind power. Okay. Um, in fact, one of my, in one of my dreams, a Walter Mitty kind of dream, I think of Japan as an energy superpower because of all the domestic stuff that could be used, the offshore floating wind stuff, um, et cetera, et cetera. But that's uh, just a uh, happy talk at the moment. So. We Thank have you. a uh, question from Jack Mormon on the healthcare sector. Jack. Yes. Thank you. A terrific uh, webinar. So, when we reach the new norm after this pandemic, is the Japanese universal health care system sustainable in the short term, longer term? And of course, you're more familiar than I with the uh, demographics, the lack of uh, caregiving uh, because of low Im immigration and other kinds of factors. So mm -hmm. what's the story on universal health care in Japan in the future mm -hmm. after we get through this pandemic? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, TJ, you want to start on that or shall I? Uh, just quickly, I, I would say that, uh, you know, obviously the costs are going up very, very rapidly. Older people require more, uh, more health care uh, per capita than, uh, than young people, as we all know. And uh, importantly, I think the, the thing that many of us look at is the number of actual workers, taxpayers, as opposed to the number of people who are dependent on the government for one or another set of benefits. And the Japanese ratio has gone from, you know, one in seven, uh, se seven workers for everyone on some version of uh, assisted living or, or healthcare necessities, healthcare payments, uh, retirement benefits to now it's one in three and it's gonna get uh, even less than that. So clearly I think there's gonna be changes in the healthcare system. I mean, you know, what's been happening is increased uh, increased uh, co-pays, uh, et cetera, to try and reduce this. The government has uh, changed its healthcare provisions to make it a bit uh, more expensive for participants, et cetera. 
but I think it, like a lot of benefits, uh, healthcare is one of those things that would be extremely difficult to roll back in any substantial way. You can make it a little bit more costly. You can make it a little bit more difficult to jump through the hoops. But I think um, in the long run, the healthcare system is, is likely to uh, continue more or less as it is. And the government is simply going to have to figure a way to pay the bills uh, better than they, uh, they, than they might uh, like to think about. So let me let me kick it over to Robbie and get his thoughts on this. Thanks. I'm a little more optimistic about it, uh, basically because it's a, another area where the technology progress is so rapid uh, that it will enable, um, if they do it right, enable substantial cost reductions. And my uh, uh, sort of catchphrase for this uh, is that Japan, nor the United States, does not have a healthcare system now. We have a sick care system. So you get sick, you go to the doctor, um, because you need treatment quickly, uh, you know, you don't care about the price, you just want to get treated. Uh, and so the high cost because of that asymmetric information, because of the monopoly position of the providers, uh, the costs of that uh, get passed on to society through this socialized medicine system, which is actually in Japan, actually a reasonably good system as, as it works. But as TJ mentioned, the costs just keep going up. So that's why we need to take um, uh, sort of take um, advantage of these new technologies uh, that are just amazingly uh, promising in terms of uh, shifting uh, from sick care to healthcare. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that we can use in particular uh, the new, uh, the very cheap um, uh, genome um, uh, technology. Uh, to figure out who is vulnerable to which diseases, which medicines will work on which people. There's a wonderful presentation by um, uh, 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 Peter Gruss, the head of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, he made a wonderful presentation about this, and he showed that the cost of uh, uh, was it uh, decoding a genome has gone from uh, I think he said 100 million US for the first one uh, down to about a thousand dollars. Okay. Um, that's pretty amazing. And what you can do with that information is figure out what medicines work, what don't work. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. Um, and so then the question is, will Japan be uh, uh, aggressive in introducing this because of the budget pressures that uh, TJ just mentioned? Uh, and there again, you have vested interests who like the old uh, technologies. Um, but uh, if you can't pay the cost, they're gonna have to consider that a little more aggressively. One of the big issues in Japan now is data uh, because uh, the, the Japanese government is just sitting on this absolute you know, gold mine of magnificent data that on patient by patient by patient by patient that's uh, accumulated uh, in the system, but it's virtually impossible for people to use it. I think there are two places uh, in the country where researchers can go and get the data in a way that is not connected to the internet at all because of privacy issues. Um, that doesn't really work anymore. Uh, and so there are a number of folks in the country who are trying to beat up on them uh, to get things done. There's a uh, young Japanese doctor working at UCLA now, uh, now named, I think Sugawa is his name, who's a big, big data specialist, Japanese trained doctor practicing in the US. So obviously he's, he's got US uh, uh, credentials as well. And he's done some wonderful work in looking at how um, uh, sort of, or at comparing uh, data use in Japan and the United States in the medical field. Uh, and as the doctors and nurses and everybody else in the medical personnel here also get older, the need to substitute technology for labor is just gonna get stronger and stronger and stronger. We're not gonna be able to maintain reasonable medical care unless we make this change. And so we're, we'll have uh, failures, uh, we'll have disasters, uh, and then people will wake up and say, no, we don't have to do it this way. And then it'll move on. It's what I call a crick cycle, a crisis response improvement and complacency cycle. At the moment, we're in complacency. Uh, and when the aging uh, puts so much pressure on that people have to move to the new technology, that's when I think we'll see some real some real progress. Just quickly, so, add, uh, just quickly to add two, two things to that. One, um, much less uh, glorified, but uh, certainly still promising is the fact that we now have uh, internet linkups to Teladoc or some version of that, which would make for a very easy way to move from that sick care to healthcare, regular checkups, 
touching mm -hmm. base with, with a physician or a, a medical provider over the internet would be a way for people of all ages to do things mm -hmm. a lot cheaper than currently is, uh, is the, uh, is the situation. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, that's just one, one more thing to, uh, add to the picture that I think mm -hmm. shows the ways in which IT could make big progress, both in the productivity of Japan, but also in dealing with some of these rising healthcare costs. Mm -hmm. And if I can add also a little personal example, um, to compare one's experience at a Japanese hospital today to what it was, say, 20 years ago, it's just night and day. Uh, I was in at Toranamon Hospital for some routine checks, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And you still have your little Shinsatsuken, the little card that you put in the machine to say, yes, I'm here, uh, I showed up. Uh, and what they do is uh, it, it's like an ATM. You put the card in, it prints out a piece of paper so that you know where to go and when to go. And that's good because you know most of the people are, are elderly, they're more used to paper, but it has exactly where to go, what floor, what room, uh, it's extremely organized. And the thing works like clockwork. I mean, I was in there and out of there exactly on schedule. The IT uh, elements, I had to have some, you know, uh, images, MRI images of this and that. Uh, and uh, so they take the MRI, they get the, pull the thing up on the screen half an hour later, the doctor can look at it, show me everything with the 3D, you know, moving this way and that way. It was extremely impressive. And this is a newly built hospital that must have been built to incorporate this technology. Now, the, what's missing is the ability of the, of the hospitals to talk to each other to share information. And that's exactly what this digitalization agency is, is supposed to be working on. Uh, so I would say that there's uh, progress in, um, in uh, applying some of the IT technologies, but I'm not sure if we've had either a cost reduction or a quality um, improvement that's commensurate with that. One interesting firm working with the same hospital is a little firm called M3. And one of the things they did uh, was uh, realize that, wait a minute, we've got all these MRI machines in the country, and the capacity utilization uh, is very low because they're basically used between eight in the morning and six at night, and then they shut down. Well, you know, couldn't we schedule, you know, some MRI, you know, uh, 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 sort of, uh, what is it, uh, uh, testing or treatments, whatever you call it. It's not a treatment, uh, investigations, whatever. Uh, couldn't we schedule those off hours so we get better capacity utilization, but do it at a lower price? So they made a deal uh, with a hospital uh, to have uh, longer service hours so that they could get more use out of the machines. That's the kind of, uh, you know, in a certain sense, Atari Maya or just obvious thing to do, but they had to work a little bit, but they got it done. So I think there are some very good minds working on this. It's just that we don't have the, uh, the top down part of it. The Meiji emperor uh, role uh, is, is not really being fulfilled quite yet. Really? Well, I, I'm afraid we have run out of time. We have some questions that we weren't able to get to. And, and maybe if those people can stick around for the networking, they can still ask it. Um, but uh, I think I better uh, draw close to the uh, or then to the, the formal presentation. And uh, again, thank you very much to uh, Professor Pimpel and Bobby Feldman. I mean, just a great job. And I've learned a lot. Uh, it's clear, clearly going to be a very challenging year for, the, uh, for Japan. Uh, both domestically and internationally, um, but I know that uh, I think we, we're still taking away a pretty optimistic view of Japan's ability to meet those challenges. Mm -hmm.